So we're here today to talk about web accessibility. You may or may not know what web, web accessibility is, and that's perfectly okay, because that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, you also may or may not know that we as public affairs and marketing, and more specifically the web communications team, have been spending a lot of time this year focusing on web accessibility and making sure that our website is usable and friendly for all persons with all abilities. It, specifically, we've been working on our web templates and our tools within OU Campus and different parts of the entire hope.edu website to make sure that they are fully accessible. And we're actually going to be rolling out some pretty major changes to the website globally uh, in, the, in the coming weeks that will uh, change a bit of how, even how the website looks to address contrast and color and some of those things. And Jeremy's gonna talk about what that means and why we're doing that. And in fact, I think give us a little sneak peek too of, uh, of the new look of the, the Hope website as well. And so anyway, I, I wanted to uh, make you all aware that we are working on those changes behind the scenes. And some of them are really big picture changes. But today, we're gonna focus on what things that you all and we all can do to make sure that when we're making edits and to our web content, that we're making those changes and adding that content in a way that is accessible so that we uh, future-proof our, our site and that we don't have uh, continuing issues going on uh, moving forward. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Jeremy Abrahams from Mighty in the Midwest in Grand Rapids. Mighty has been our primary web design and development partner for a number of years, dating back to the initial uh, hope.edu website redesign, which we launched in 2015. We have a couple other members uh, from Mighty here today. Cliff is here and Danny's here, and so thank you to them uh, for participating as well. Jeremy is the senior developer and UX strategist at Mighty, and he's also a web accessibility expert. He, uh, my words, not his. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's going to tell us today, uh, teach us and tell us all about web accessibility, what it is, why it's important, and what we can do to make sure that uh, we're uh, keeping our website fully accessible. One last note. Uh, Phil Blau is here and we're videotaping this presentation. Um, so I wanted you to know that that is happening, but also so that for your own uh, benefit and for anyone who is unable to attend today, we'll be making this video as well as the presentation materials available to anyone uh, as a, a future reference or for those who are unable to attend. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce Jeremy. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, so like Jason said, uh, the team at Mighty and Jason and Craig and the web communications team have been spending a lot of time over the past several months working on the accessibility measures that I'm gonna describe uh, for the hope.edu site. And I wouldn't be surprised if for uh, some of you or even many of you that web accessibility might be kind of a new thing. So by the end of this talk, you'll know what web accessibility is and how to incorporate it in your day-to-day -day basis. So, oops, there we go. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about the physical and cognitive differences that we enable with accessible design and types of assistive technologies that, and accommodations that many people rely on, right? So I'll cover term some terminology that you'll likely hear. And finally, I'm gonna teach you how to create and maintain accessible content. So we've set aside some time at the end of this talk for questions. So as I'm introducing and going over these topics, just make note of uh, any question that you may have and we'll uh, make sure that we can get to that at the end. Cool, so what is web accessibility? Very broadly speaking, accessibility on the web means the degree to which a site's content is available and functional. But accessibility feels bigger than that, right? We may have heard terms like WCAG, or screen readers, or alt text, or conformance. So let's figure that out, and let's figure out how each of us, no matter what our role is, can and does play a role in making the hope.edu website accessible. But first, some context. 56 million Americans, this is roughly 19% of the US population, report having some type of disability. And 38 million of that number report having a serious disability. And according to the National Center for Education Statistics, over 11% of post-secondary students report having a disability. So, what constitutes a disability? There are five types of physical and cognitive differences that we enable with web accessibility. Web accessibility enables people who experience vision differences. This includes people with blindness, low vision, color blindness, 
age-related degeneration, and even temporary conditions. Web accessibility ena enables users to experience auditory differences. This includes people with some form of hearing loss, including deafness. Web accessibility enables users to experience motor impairments. This would include people that may have limitations of muscle strength or control. This can include things like involuntary movements or paralysis. This also includes joint disorders, things like arthritis or pain that would impede movement. Web accessibility enables users who also experience cognitive differences. This refers to any kind of problem understanding, remembering, or concentrating on content. This includes people that are on the autism spectrum, have lower literacy, that are dyslexic, experience ADD and ADHD. This also includes non-native speakers and situational or temporary things, like people who are extremely tired or under stress or even in loud or hectic environments. And finally, web accessibility enables users who experience vestibular and seizure disorders. The most common vestibular, uh, excuse me, the most common seizure disorder is epilepsy. And someone with a vestibular disorder can experience vertigo, dizziness, nausea, and motion sickness just from using a website or app. So these are people that are being excluded when we don't make the sites, our sites, accessible. We're talking about millions of people and over 11% of students, people who rely on us to deliver a site that they can use by accommodating their needs and by supporting the assistive technologies that they rely on. The good news is that this is doable. And even better, making websites accessible makes them more usable for everybody, regardless of their situation. So let's take a look at some common assistive technologies. But first, an assistive technology is a thing like an app or a device or even a plugin that people use to navigate the web and consume content. And one of the most common assistive technologies uh, for people with access needs is a screen reader. And as you probably guessed, a screen reader reads the content of a page or a screen. But more importantly, they're able to look at a website's code and structure. And by doing so, they're not only able to communicate the words on the page, but also the hierarchy and functionality of that content. So I recorded a screencast of the existing hope.edu website being announced by a screen reader. I'm going to play it on the next screen for about a minute and a half, and it's going to read from the student body page. Pay attention to how it moves across the screen and the types of phrases and words that it use, uses to sort of indicate element types, functionality, and settings. Student body vertical line admissions, web content, link, skip to content, visited, link, Hope College, the Hope College logo, heading level two, site navigation, search term, search term, edit text, search, search button, list six items, visited, link, academics, visited, link, admissions, visited, link, research, link, arts, visited, link, campus life, visited, link, athletics, heading level two, breadcrumb navigation, list three items, Visited link, home, visited link, admissions, student body, slash, visited link, admissions office, heading level one, student body, students who attend Hope College come from a wide array of backgrounds and locations, as Hope continually aspires to provide a real-world global perspective. These students are academically driven and work closely with top educators in their field. The result, high retention rates and success after graduation. Hope is not just a place, it's a community, and it's the people of Hope who will recognize all the qualities that make you an individual. Here at Hope we desire you to grow as a whole person, academically, spiritually and socially, whether it's hanging with friends at one of the regular, link, student activities committee, events, participating in collaborative research with a professor, worshipping with 1,000 of your peers at the, link, gathering, or just hanging out in downtown Holland, Hope is ready to meet you where you are and help you become the person you want to be. A Hope student plays the violin during our annual Christmas Vespers service image. Oh, and if you're looking for facts and figures, he'd come to the right place. Heading level two, our student body, row one of seven, column one of two, total enrollment, column two of two, 3,150, row two of seven, column one of two, males, full time, column two of two, 1,282, row three of seven, column one of two, females. So hopefully you could hear the screen reader announced not only the content of the page, but also the functional aspects of the student body page. Things like buttons, links, the navigation, images, and even the table at the very end. 
So screen readers rely on structure that gets added to the page, and without that structure, it would be unable to clearly describe the element types and functional aspects of the page. So that was actually a pretty good example. But we're going to learn later how each of us can author content and use built-in tools in a way that optimizes them for screen readers. OK. An uh, individuals that experience permanent or temporary mobility differences often rely on methods other to navigate websites that accommodate their differences. This could include joysticks, switches, and even voice commands. But the most common method for navigating is probably using the keyboard. So to get a better understanding of what that looks like, I'm going to demo the REI.com website. So this site does a really good job of highlighting the current active element. It also does a really good job of maintaining a logical sequence as it navigates throughout the page and throughout the content. So as you can see, it highlights the current element and it actually navigates in what we sort of perceive as that logical order from top to bottom, from left to right. So this is a really good example of what it looks like to have a site optimized for keyboard navigation. So, as we saw, assistive technologies can aid in navigating websites and consuming content. But by default, they aren't able to assist in everything. The majority of accessibility accommodations required are covered by what we add to the HOPE website. So how do we do this? And how do we know where to start? And how do we measure success? The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also known as WCAG. This is the current legal precedent for applying the Americans with Disabilities Act for websites. Created by the World Wide Web Consortium to provide a single shared standard for web content accessibility that meets the needs of individuals, organizations, and governments. Now, WCAG has three levels indicated by A, AA, and AAA. A being the most general, up to AAA being the most specific and strict. The version and level of web content accessibility guidelines that we will adhere to is AA, which is the current legal precedent. And since the guidelines are on their second version, this makes up the term WCAG 2.0 AA. So how do we make our website conform to these guidelines? WCAG is organized into four principles. Big picture themes stating that content needs to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So what do those mean? Perceivable means that no matter which senses people have access to, that they are able to consume content. And operable means that no matter which senses people have access to, that they are able to interact with all of the elements on the site. Understandable is that the content and interactions on the site are not beyond the user's understanding. And robust, that means that the site can be used with a variety of assistive technologies and devices. Now those 12 principles are, are organized into 12 guidelines that address issues particular to people with access needs. And those guidelines have specific testing criteria that describe how to meet those access needs. In total, there are 61 success criteria, and meeting all 61 means that we have a WCAG conformant website. So I want to take a moment to briefly preview some of the updates to the hope.edu website. These are things that the team at Mighty and Jason and Craig and the web communications team all worked on over the past couple months. Um, we use WCAG to sort of guide uh, the decisions that we made. So I want to just sort of demo this. Here it is. Uh, this is a beta version of the site, so please excuse the placeholder text. Uh, take note of a couple things right off the bat, right? We updated the colors to achieve the necessary level of contrast for users with vision differences. We also optimized for keyboard navigation. So we made sure to draw really good attention to what element currently has the focus. We introduced some scrolling considerations. That would be in the sort of group of three features just below the banner. It's going to get to it in a second. Um, previously, uh, when we would navigate to those features with a keyboard, it was kind of a, a, 
a tough experience. So we made sure to pull those out and really feature those in a way that keyboard navigators would easily be able to consume that content. Something also you might notice is that we, we used, uh, we noticed that color was being used to sort of describe and inform information. So uh, on these news cards and on these event cards, the departments were indicated by a color. Uh, for people with vision impairments and color blindness specifically, those colors sort of bleed together and kind of get lost in the shuffle. And so as part of the updates, we added the department name to these cards so that we're not relying on that single source of uh, color being the only way to inform. All right. So a lot of the work that we did on the new version was to the actual code of the website. All right. While these, these changes consisted of substantial changes, really only a couple people can implement them. So you might be asking yourself, what's left and where do I fit in? So, even when all of those changes are implemented, the hope.edu website is at risk of losing conformance with any and every change that we make as content creators. Every time we update a blog post, every time we add an image or a link, anything gets added can put the site at risk for losing conformance. But don't worry, because I'm going to show everyone how to create and maintain accessible content. All right. Here are the six areas in which content creators can affect accessibility and conformance. Images. Most pages, posts, and events will contain images. Right? Images lend context and aesthetics to the content that we publish. But before I fully cover images, I want to introduce the concept of single sense content basically means that content that can only be consumed via one sense, right? Images can only be seen. Audio can only be heard. Text, on the other hand, text can be seen on the screen. Text can be heard through a screen reader, and text can even be felt with the assistance of braille displays. So it needs to be our goal to sort of identify and augment this content that can only be experienced with a single sense. And here's how. So since text can be experienced via all three of the web available senses, now thankfully, taste and smell have not made their way into HTML yet, um, the text is the best way to make sure that our content can be consumed by everyone. So for images, the most common way to do this is through alt text. I found that for some people, with some familiarity with accessibility, alt text tends to be the one thing or one of the first things that they think about when we talk about accessibility. Basically, it's a way for the single sense, that visual file format of images, to not only include information about the contents of an image, but to tie that description directly to the image file. For users that rely on screen readers, this alt text is crucial for understanding the information and the context communicated through images. And missing or incorrect alt text is one of the most common errors that I encounter when checking a website's conformance to WCAG. So every time you add an image, you have to add alt text. Thankfully, Omni Update provides a way for us to include alt text when adding an image. OU calls it a description. And when OU adds that image to a page or post, it formats it so that the contents of that description field get directly tied and linked to that image and then are communicated via assistive technologies. So we know that we need to include alt text. We know how to include alt text. So what makes for good alt text? Alt text should be concise and descriptive. And more than just describing the image, the alt text should convey the meaning of the image, right? This meaning could be practical, emotional, or both. The alt text should describe the subject of the image, be it the person, place, or thing. And it can describe an action taking place in the image. So if there's something happens, that's key for alt text. It should also describe any emotional content in the image. Further, we want to provide the same information a sighted user would get from looking at the image. Also, context matters when writing successful alt text. What type of page is this image going to be on? 
what's the content before and after this image? And what connection does this image have to the content? And finally, who's the audience for this content? Is this for a page intended for students? Is it intended for parents or, or faculty? The context and the audience guides the alt text that we will author. Some important notes about authoring alt text. Avoid including the phrase image of. This is redundant. Assistive technologies will communicate that the content or element is an image. And as we saw in the student body screen reader demo, when it encountered that image, it read the alt text first and then said image afterwards. So alt text and assistive technologies already have that built in, so we don't need to include image of or photo of. For logos, you can include the organization's name followed by the word logo. So for example, the Hope College logo. You should avoid images of just text, right? So if you can't, you'll, you're going to need to transcribe all of the text from that image into the alt text. Um, charts and graphs, they have a bit more complex alt text requirements, right? You may need to transcribe all of the content if it's not already on the page in another form. Now, if the chart is just being included to sort of sell or present a single point, something like sales increased 50% last quarter, you can use that for the alt text. And finally, decorative images are allowed to have empty alt text, but be wary of this. Our goal is to communicate to all users the same level of information and emotion. And if a specific image isn't communicating information or emotion, you should ask yourself, should it even be included on the page? Now, if it does, if it needs to be on the page, it's fine to leave that alt text blank. So, I'm gonna demonstrate my thought process for author authoring alt text for a couple images. Let's consider that this image is being proposed for a page for prospective students. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find that maybe on another website, alt text for an image like this could be something like soccer game or crowd at soccer game. I mean, it describes the image, but it doesn't really do a good, very good job about it. So here's, here's a, uh, a version that I would likely propose. So a large crowd of excited fans wearing team colors standing up and cheering at a soccer game. A little bit more of a boast, but it describes sort of that weight and that emotion and the energy behind that image. So it shows words like excited and standing up and cheering to really sort of paint the picture of what the emotion and the weight behind this image is. Here's another one. Actually, why don't we all sort of just take a moment and think of how we might write alt text for this image. All right, so again, I wouldn't be surprised to find on another website um, alt text for this image that says something like photo of torn down house from tornado, right? Yes, it describes the image. That's what that image is, but it doesn't really convey any of that meaning. Uh, my take would be a young woman comforts a man in front of a house and automobiles destroyed by a tornado, right? The focal point is the couple, the woman comforting the man, and the, the destruction behind them sort of sets the stage and sort of embellishes on what the sort of emotional meaning of this image is. So it's, it's that kind of thought process that I apply when authoring alt text. Okay, most of the content on our pages is gonna be text. So let's learn how to optimize this for people with access needs. Here's how we can do that. Write simply and clearly, create structure with our elements, use the built-in features to decorate and style text, Avoid able assumptive language, and we need to be concise. So let's dig into writing simply and clearly. First, we need to keep writing at an appropriate level. The recommendation is no higher than an eighth grade reading level for general audiences. For something like highly technical content meant for specific audiences, you'll need to use your discretion. But for just general pages, general audience, we want to keep it at an eighth grade level. I can't stress enough from a user experience perspective and from an accessibility perspective how important it is to get the reading level to that appropriate level. This is especially important for individuals that are non-native speakers 
or have dyslexia or other cognitive differences. Now, one way that I use to check the reading level of a page is using the Hemingway Editor website. So Hemingway is a free website located at HemingwayApp.com. This tool allows you to paste in a block of text. Here I dropped in uh, a short passage from a Sherlock Holmes novel. And as you can see, this passage was calculated uh, at a fifth grade reading level. That's in the, the top of the page. So what I love about this tool is that it highlights the areas where individuals uh, may struggle with higher reading levels. You're able to make edits and instantly see how those changes affect the reading level. Now behind the scenes, the Hemingway editor uses the automated readability index to calculate the grade level. Obviously, if you have another preferred tool or you already have an existing workflow, use that. But for accessible content, we need to aim for that eighth grade reading level or lower. All right. Another way to optimize our text is to create structure with headings, lists, and media. Long passages of text can become overwhelming to some individuals. People with dyslexia and those on the autism spectrum especially experience this. People that rely on screen readers also prefer to have long pages broken up by headings and other elements. And this is especially convenient because screen readers allow those users to quickly jump from heading to heading. Here's a representation of what can happen to some people with dyslexia. Sometimes with long passages of text, they experience this warping effect. So even small steps that we make just by breaking up long passages with headings, an image, or something like that can make a big difference to a big group of people. All right. Another way to optimize our text is to use OmniUpdate's built-in formatting options to sort of define different content elements, like headlines. As I'm sure you're aware, Omni Update provides a pretty robust editor. But with that flexibility comes the opportunity to create non-accessible content. Using only the built-in features will ensure that the structure of your content is optimized. And as we saw in the demonstration earlier, the screen reader is able to announce when a specific piece of content was a headline. Right? So just using visual tools to make text bigger or bolder or uppercase or something like that, a screen reader is not going to know that that's actually intended to be a headline. So the, for the people that rely on that, that extra accommodations and that structure that's uh, sort of baked into how a screen reader announces that content, be sure to use the built-in tool. Also. When choosing a, a heading as a formatting option, we need to make sure that our headings follow an order and are not chosen based on visual style. Right? So don't choose a specific heading because you like how the way that it looks. Heading numbers reflect relationships. So a heading number two will belong to a heading, level, a heading one above it. Or a heading three is going to belong to a heading number two. Lastly, don't skip levels. So for example, don't author content that only has that really nice big heading number one, but then uses uh, a heading number three because you like the way it looks. So don't, and so don't skip over that number two heading. All right. Another way to optimize our text for accessibility is to avoid able assumptive language. Right? The green button, the upper left hand corner. So when announced through a screen reader, the button isn't green. And there is no upper left-hand corner. Also, we need to be mindful of verbs that assume ability. So if somebody is navigating via other means, other than a mouse, like a keyboard or voice-controlled assistive technologies, they won't be clicking. Be concise. Consider that individuals may rely on additional accommodations to experience the website and that those accommodations may make their experience take longer than you may realize. Now, it's not uncommon for individual pages to take well over several minutes for a screen reader to read the entirety of the page. Users relying on that, they can't skim through the content. They can't just you know, scroll past something. So lengthy passages of text can be cumbersome to get through. And there's also. Uh, this is also a great consideration for users with cognitive differences, too. 
So be mindful of the amount of text that you are adding to a page as a whole. All right. Another type of content that we can optimize is links. The infamous read more link. All right, I'm sure we've all seen this. Some of us may have even added this to a page. Aside from links like this not really doing us any search engine favors, uh, changing these will benefit users uh, with autism, users with cognitive challenges. But this can be especially important for people that rely on screen readers. We have to make sure that the destination, the action, or the result of interacting with an element is clear to our users. So here's, here's the reason why. Many screen readers provide a tool that extracts all of the links out from a single page and then places them in this menu. This tool allows them to quickly navigate between those links in interactive elements. But, as you can see, when that happens, it doesn't receive the context surrounding those links, only the actual link text. And what's worse is that some screen readers even alphabetize this list. So we can't even rely on the natural order of a page, right? So take a look at the image. Where do any of those read more links take you? So this is why we need to remove those. Another part of good link text involves eliminating repetition, right? While these links on the screen are more descriptive than the previous read more, the user has to listen to the entire link being read because the only distinguishing piece of information is that very last word. So I'm going to demo fixing some example links. All right. Hosting an event, learn more about our catering options. Right? Doesn't seem too too out of the ordinary, but I think a better example could be hosting an event, learn more about our catering options. It's the same text, it's the same copy. I only switched what piece of text and what phrase was chosen as the link. And if we think back to that screen reader menu, if we were to remove the surrounding context, catering options is much more clear than learn more. Here's another one. Supercharge your free time. Join us for the first ever hobby fair to find your next great passion. Hands-on workshops, demonstrations, and giveaways. Learn more. So take a second and think about how you may optimize this. Here's what I have. This one didn't require much editing either. I removed the learn more from the very end once I selected hobby fair as my link text, right? If we think about those two in comparison, learn more as a link text and hobby fair as a link text displayed in that screen reader menu, hobby fair is incredibly clear and very descriptive. I, I, I know where I'm gonna land, right? If I interact with that link. All right, we'll do one more. So think about how you'd change this example to make it more clear. All right, here's what I have. So for me, this one required a minor edit. Even though Facebook is more descriptive as link text than read more, once it's removed from the surrounding content, it loses the clarity, right? Facebook for what? Facebook.com, Hope's Facebook page, my Facebook page? We're not gonna be able to know. So I, choose, I chose to uh, make that small edit and include Facebook with the fundraiser's name, which did require a small edit. And so I, I came up with uh, the link text of being Books for Tots on Facebook, right? Books for Tots on Facebook is incredibly more clear than just Facebook alone. All right. Lists. Lists are incredibly helpful for users with cognitive challenges and people with autism. They also create structure that I covered in previous steps. And screen readers really uh, are able to shine with lists. Um, they're able to announce the length of a list and they're able to identify each bullet point. And you may not have caught it, but in that, that first demonstration, it, it announced the site's navigation as a link, and it said, uh, link group 
six items. And so there were six navigation elements within that list. Um, so for creating lists, we need to be sure that we use the built-in formatting in Omni Update. Right? If we try to fake a list by doing line breaks and hyphens or dashes or even like the asterisks or we find like a little bullet icon, this is going to confuse screen readers because they rely on that sort of baked in structure from using the built in formatting tools. All right. A couple more notes. We need to choose the type of list based on the need not the visuals, right? So if we think of bulleted lists with the circle and numbered lists coming with numbers, bulleted lists are great for when order is not essential. But numbered lists should be used when the list describes a specific and ordered sequence. Also, we should start instruction lists, uh, the list items with action verbs. Things like write, check, test, make. This clarity really helps people with cognitive differences. And remember how I said optimizing for accessibility helps everyone? Here's an example. This is a recipe for cooking a steak. I placed action verbs as the first word. So we see things like place the steak and whisk together and pour it over and preheat the broiler. These instructions are incredibly clear. And I have a pretty good idea of the entire step just based on that first word. So compare that to the original recipe. Which one would you rather be standing in front of a hot stove or grill with you know, ingredients? Um, I would certainly prefer the other one. So this is the power of lists, right? Anytime you can break up long passages of content into manageable items, it's going to help many of the individuals that we've discussed. All right, the next content type that we need to consider is media. So another kind of text alternative that we can use are captions and transcripts. So for individuals with hearing differences, this is vital that captions are provided. There are also users that actually prefer to read the transcript or uh, captions because they can find videos distracting or disorienting. So for hope.edu, all videos will need to have text alternatives in the form of captions. This even means videos that are embedded into Hope pages. Basically, if it is on your site, it is your responsibility for providing accessible accommodations. Now, from a workflow perspective, here are the caption requirements. All videos that go on the HOPE YouTube channel are now required to be captioned. And all videos that are embedded into a page must be on the HOPE YouTube channel. So if you have any questions about this workflow or how this may affect you, reach out to Jason or Elizabeth at Public Affairs and Marketing with any questions. All right. With a bit of effort, assistive technologies can be very good at interpreting and communicating content on web pages. We've covered exactly how to optimize content for them in the previous steps. Often though, other forms of embedded media like PDFs don't have the same authoring and accessibility features. Right? So it's our goal to avoid limiting content to only embedded files. Basically, if you can add the content to a page, do so. All right, and visual design. Omni Update does limit a lot of the visual design choices to preset options, and this helps us maintain conformance. However, visual design choices have a big impact on accessibility. So I want to talk about some of the considerations surrounding accessible design. For this website, this would apply to any time that you're creating graphics, charts, illustrations that are going to appear on the hope.edu website. But you can also apply these same considerations to things of your own, like lecture slides and presentations, and basically anything else that you're going to create to help them become more accessible. So contrast, right? We saw that change in the new version of the HOPE site. We did this to achieve the, the needed uh, amount of contrast. So this is incredibly important for people with vision differences. Now contrast ratio is how we numerically define the amount of contrast between an element and its background. Now WCAG 2.0 requires that normal paragraph sized text have a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1, and larger text only requires a contrast ratio of about 3 to 1. So here's an example of that in practice. 
This first line is the darkest black on pure white background. Now that combination gives us a 21 to 1 contrast ratio. And the last line is the lightest gray that we can put on pure white background to maintain that WCAG conformance. That one has a, a 4.5 to 1 ratio. So how do we determine whether or not the designs that we have created have enough contrast? There's a couple ways. To test, I like to recommend a website called accessible-colors.com. To use this, what you'll need is you'll need to know the color of your background and the color of your text. And there are form fields that they have you input those, and then it'll output the, the contrast ratio. And it'll even give you suggestions if you don't have quite enough contrast. Maybe it'll suggest lightening the background or maybe darkening the text on the page. Now, for the designers, there are plugins that we can add to, think, to Photoshop or other tools that we use that were, allows us to test as we're building and as we're designing the contrast ratio of the background and that element. So part of the work that Mighty did recently required that we take a look at all of the colors that were being used on the website. We needed to make sure that we had achieved and maintained the sufficient uh, contrast ratio requirements to meet WCAG requirements. Unfortunately, the Hope Orange doesn't have enough contrast ratio when used in normal paragraph sizes. So there were buttons that were used on, in the sidebar. There, there was the, the header that was orange and had white text. None of that met the sufficient level of that contrast requirement, so that precipitated the change. And as you saw um, in the demonstration earlier, there were other co color changes that we incorporated into the new site as well. Those were all based around uh, maintaining the brand colors but achieving that contrast ratio. So for the rest of the colors on the screen, these were sort of used to indicate the, the individual departments. Some of those didn't have enough contrast ratio either, so they needed to be updated. Okay. Another thing to consider is to avoid using color alone to inform, right? I talked about this a little bit earlier. People with color blindness are especially impacted by this. So what do I mean by color alone? Here's a pattern I'm sure we've all seen before. It's a form, and this form has an error. But the only way that that error is being communicated to us was by changing the background and the color of that form field, right? There's no error that says you didn't fill out the email address right or don't forget to do this. It's just changed from white to red and then the successful ones are that light green. This is what a person with color blindness sees. Right? That once red error field now looks exactly the same as the rest. And without an error message instructing them of a problem, they may not ever be able to fix the problem and then submit the form. So while this example is of a form where you might need to be mindful of this in your own work, is where you're creating charts, graphs, and illustrations. Right? So remember, when we're trying to convey information, we need to make sure that we're using methods beyond color alone and that doing so will help users with low vision and color blindness. Now I chose, I chose these colors and I ran them through a color blindness simulator, right? I mean, that is a very vibrant red. That's a, that's a stop sign race car red and it's a very green, green. But applied with a, a filter applied over it, uh, sort of simulating a, a type of color blindness called protonopia, all three of those colors look exactly the same. So keep that in mind when creating these graphics, illustrations, and charts that you want to use in your presentations and on the website. Okay. So I applied that same color blindness filter to the old version of the news section on the home page. The department colors were being used as um, a way to identify you know, what department that, that news uh, post belonged to or what department that event belonged to. But as we can see with that, with that same color blindness filter applied, you really can't make a distinction very well between the arts and the athletics and even the academics and the research starts to kind of blend and, and bleed together, right? So here's, here's what the new version of the site does. We've added the department name to the very top of that card. So even users with low vision and color blindness aren't um, 
are able to, to know that the academic department has a pretty busy schedule, right? So while using color to sort of convey meaning and relationships is important, just make sure it's not the only way you're doing so. Okay, so following these tips will have you creating and maintaining accessible content. Now, the last step is to make sure the content that we've created or updated meets WCAG conformance. So how do we test? We test with a combination of automated tools and manual checks. Now thankfully, OU provides us with the ability to run an automated test and to check the conformance of a particular page. Now even better, we can do this while we are editing and adding content, and here's how. So, while editing a page, we're able to select the page check tool. And doing this will help prevent publishing a page that is not accessible during the authoring process. Here's a demo. So it looks like we have an error. And it is an image that has no alt text, right? So like I mentioned earlier, that's a pretty common error. And we've learned how to fix that. So you're encouraged to try and fix the problems as you discover them. But if you're not sure how, be sure to notify the web communications team about the issue that you are observing. Right? So while the OU checker is incredibly convenient, for 100% conformance, the work doesn't end at the OU page check. Even though it's integrated into the system, it's unable to catch all of the potential errors that we need to prevent to maintain WCAG conformance. And even the best automated checker is only ever going to be able to catch about 40% of possible issues. Here's a quote from the Omni Update blog. Well, there are many great tools out there. They can't catch everything. And here's a quote from W3C, the creators of WCAG. The full quote, quote reads, there are automated tools that help with evaluation. However, no tool alone can determine if a site meets accessibility standards. Knowledgeable human evaluation is required to determine if a site is accessible. This means that there needs to be manual testing as well as the automated testing that I just covered. So what about that 60%? That's where the manual testing comes in. So here's a checklist of things that require, as W3C put it, knowledgeable humans to check. And conveniently, these tie into the steps that we just learned for creating and maintaining accessible content. So while automated checkers are unable to determine if our images have high quality alt text, we know how to write good quality alt text. We know to convey both meaning and emotion as we author that. And while automated checkers are unable to determine if our text is clear, concise, and well-structured, we know how to write clear and concise content. And we know to use the built-in Omni Update tools to add structure that is optimized for assistive technologies. And automated checkers are unable to determine if our links have high quality text, but we know how to write high quality text. We know to make sure that the destination or action or result needs to be clear, even when removed from the surrounding context. Automated checkers are unable to know whether or not our videos have captions, but we know that all of our videos added to the Hope YouTube channel must have captions. And lastly, while automated checkers are unable to determine if we're using color alone to inform, we know how to create images that use other elements other than just color as a means of conveying information. So it's important that before you publish content to manually double check everything on this list because we run the risk of publishing content that is not accessible and not conformant. And even though we can't future-proof every part of our website. We now know how to create and maintain accessible content. We're able to combine automated testing and manual checks to validate the conformance of the hope.edu website.
And before we wrap things up, I want to share one final thought. Right? There is no normal. We all have different abilities and different levels of those abilities. We are the gatekeepers of access, and our environments will either create or remove barriers for millions of people. Hope.edu is our environment, and it's within our power to remove access barriers for our users. Thank you. Thank you.